couch is cosy. All right. Hello. Welcome to one of the moderated talks here at Super Ordinary in Brisbane. As you all know, Brisbane Street Art Festival has been happening in Brizzy since 2016. It's rapidly growing into one of Australia's biggest street art festivals, which is awesome. Right now, there are 40 artworks uh, happening throughout Brisbane um, with some of the most established and emerging artists throughout, honestly, the world. Um, I came all the way from America just to see it and be a part of it. So. Right. Um, there are also a bunch of creative events happening, which you should check out. You're obviously here at one of them. And today we're going to have a conversation about art and activism um, with three artists who do just that. Um, yeah. <laughs> listen, blue hair. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Ilma Gore and I'm an artist and activist. Um, I'm going to be moderating today and before we start I wanted to ask if Barongo would do uh, uh, a thanking the elders of past and present if you were comfortable with doing that before we started. Uh, I'd be happy to um, acknowledge the ongoing unbroken care for country, um, continued unbroken sovereignty, generosity and beauty of the two local mobs, the Yugger and Tarabal. Um, mention their elders, mention the Ruska family, the five clans, and offer our ongoing respect, esteem, and gratitude for everything that they do, in particular their elders. Thank you. Well born, if you wanted to do a 30 second interpretive dance, that's also welcome. <laughs> I've been practicing, so I hope you're ready. <laughs> All right, the timer starts now, go. <laughs> so Lisa can beatbox. Yeah. No? Okay. So from um, the right to the left towards me is Wellborn. Hi, how are you going? Lisa. Hello. And Baranga. Do you guys want to start? We'll do the format as if closest to me. So Baranga, you can answer the question first. We'll go to Lisa and then to Wellborn. If you want to start by introducing yourself and some of the art you do, that would be awesome. I'm Baranga Wiradjuri. I'm a Wiradjuri man. I'm a long way off country. My home range is Bathurst. My home area is Bathurst. Uh, my personal law is the same as my, my name, which is a cultural naming. Um, Baranga or Birung in Wiradjuri means sky with reference to long distance view. We're known as big sky country. Um, I was named after our way. If you get named, you're named after your great grandparents. So my great grandfather was Biranga, etc. It goes back, but it was also uh, one of the uh, creator ancestors around our way. Um, my family law is storytelling. And what was the rest of the... Oh, yeah. Um, we uh, started out, I guess, with a, with a bit of a notion about around requiring a sphere of influence, broad, deep and well-resourced enough to do the work that we're here, the cultural work, to fulfil our cultural responsibilities. Um, probably put that out in about 2009, 2010, and since then, you know, the, the gigs just to keep turning up, um, to not be a wanker as much as possible, and um, to make sure that everything you do is... Um, I guess we work from a um, drawn on six generations back, punching forward nine, so you kind of... you're working dead. It's very hard for your ego to become involved when you're not going to be around to see the result. I guess it could go the other way too. You could go harder, so to make sure that you recognise, but that's kind of how we go. Um, our our uh, central law, Yinjimara, underpins and informs everything we do, every aspect of our timing, our mindset, our attitude, our delivery, our engagement, what we will and won't, um, what we do and don't. And that's a five column event, which is to do slowly, which means you respond rather than react, to be polite, to be gentle, to honour and respect, but the, thing is you've got to do all five at once. There's no, you know, you can't cherry pick. Um, as far as what I do, it's really fulfilled my cultural responsibility. Um, I was saying a brother boy there um, before, it really, I think we um, had a synergy around it where, um, you know, the least important aspect of anything I do is art. Um, but it does get you into all levels of society and makes you therefore the most dangerous, as the saying goes. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. All right, Lisa, if you don't mind introducing yourself and telling us what you do. 
Yeah, sure. Um, hello, my name is Lisa and I'm a therapist. Um, I'm part Vietnamese, Australian. That infuses a lot of the work that I do um, with arts and uh, have, coming from a social work or, or counselling kind of background, I've had a lot of opportunity to work with communities to deliver public artworks, um, hearing their personal stories and connection to, to the place where the art is delivered. So, um, yeah, a little bit of experience across both of, both of those areas and public art is something that I've um, come to pretty recently in the last couple of years. So before that, did a lot of studio art and illustration kind of work and, um, and, and do a lot of arts um, through my therapeutic practice as well. So that's Amazing. me. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well born. Hello, how are you? Um, yeah, I'm a Narrabore man. Um, that's the uh, Glen Innes region, uh, northern New South Wales area. Um, I go by the alias of Wellborn, uh, which is Celtic for Owen. Um, <coughs> essentially, my mother is a Narrabor woman and my father is Welsh. Um, I decided to run with the alias of Wellborn essentially because of at the point in which I started to embrace expressionism in this format, the association of how I saw myself um, wasn't refined enough for me to attack um, my Indigenous noble journey so early in my career um, with the depth of respect that I have for the journey that I'm on and the amount I need to learn, I felt it was inappropriate for me to attack it at that point and therefore I've grown into Wellborn from that. Um, as we were saying earlier, we're having a chin wag about uh, I'm a visual artist at the moment. Um, Essentially, that's just because it's the perfect medium um, to, I suppose, be reckless. I'll just simplify it to scream without making any noise. Um, it also seems to be really effective at this particular time, um, in this particular time period. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I feel like that's because of the simple fact that uh, we seem to be going through a bit of a culture shift in society at the moment. There seems to be a real change in the way that people are engaging um, with artists. Um, of course, there's still a long way to go, but I definitely do feel like uh, visual art was, has been the best choice that I've made um, because of the simple fact that people have more time to interpret the message. People have a sense of comfort and security in knowing that there's no crucial need to be knowing the answer to the question straight away. It encourages engagement, um, which to me seems to be the most important part of this whole process is to, is to engage with the audience um, and to help identify the simple fact that the, it's, it's more than just a painting. It's uh, the purpose behind the painting and the reason for why the painting was even created in the first place. So if I was to describe myself, I would just describe myself as a medium um, rather than a visual artist. I, I just find myself to be a medium between paths for people. Um, and I think that that comes with like exploring fearlessness or exploring fear as itself as an element. And uh, yeah, that'd be the best way for me to describe Wellborn. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, I'm just a French duke who sits in hammocks all day What's eating up? soft cheeses. So I would love to do yeah. that. Far out. <laughs> that <Listen>. Sounds amazing. <laughs> Better than my life. Um, what I the interesting thing I find about art and activism, particularly if you want to call it activism, mm. I think it's just speaking out or living your truth. Mm. Um, is that a lot of people see the finished piece, whether it be music, poetry, or visual arts? And they see something so beautiful if you're a good artist. And they forget the reason why it was created to begin with. Mm. And oftentimes the reason is quite sad or challenging. And so I guess my next question is, is there a piece um, that you've done or the moment in time you realized that you wanted to be an artist? I know it's a, a silly question, but is there a moment where you were like, I know that this is what I'm doing, this is what I want to do? or this is a piece that has inspired more of my works? Is there a moment for you that defined your career in art? Yeah. Um, a number of them, it keeps happening. Um, <laughs> it does, doesn't it? The, um, the it doesn't stop. <laughs> no, it never really, stops, it just really. changes. <laughs> I think when it does, though, you need to listen, you know, and mm. make space, but it hasn't yet. Um, I think the first, for me, was... Um, 
a conversation that I had because I was in the... I had about three years at the luxury of having three years just to paint. I said to Suze one day, hey, you know, all that stuff that I do to bring in my part of the, the income, that's going to stop. I'm just going to paint. Nobody's ever seen me. I've never done anything. I'm not an artist. It'll be great. And um, she said, no, no, <laughs> we won't do that. You can do 50-50. And to my credit, I probably did about 3% what I was usually doing and about 97% the rest. And she wore that, which was very supportive. <laughs> um, but what was happening was we were seeing a great friend and colleague of, of ours, Wayne Weaver, and partner of ours, Wayne Weaver, who's an artist in his own, an exceptional artist in his own right, Vietnam vet, life sentence prisoner, um, great friend of the mob. Um, and I were looking at this piece that I'd done and uh, it was as ugly as all get out. And, you know, one of my things is don't be afraid to paint ugly. Please don't be afraid to paint ugly. It's really important. Um, and it had a horrible feeling about it. I knew it was a strong piece. It was quite early. It would have only been probably the maybe eighth piece I'd done or seventh piece I'd done. And because he's ex-military, he said, I wonder what those white things are, are in it. And um, I joined him in that interest because... He, Something had to explain how foul this thing was. Um, and he said, well, can you put... Because he's analogue, like, fully. He said, can you... I wonder, could we get it in black and white? So I did the magic of the phone. <laughs> and as a, as a post-analogue human. And um, it was clearly a night sky. So some of good conversations from there. Um, I, I, I sent it to a friend... Uh, in uh, Kilcarn on country, down south end of Wiradjuri country, um, who's an author and researcher. And I purposely didn't want to know anything about what, was, what I was painting. And I've just never been to a gallery, never been to an opening, unless I wandered through one at some point. Um, and she asked, could she send the black and white image to a friend of hers? And I said, well, I'm, I'm happy for that. Who's your friend? And she said, she's an astrophysicist in Sweden. And I said, yeah, no worries. Could you just send that picture and... We all have that friend. Um, <laughs> she's she, she's connected. I think I'm the most connected person because I know the people I know, not because of my connections. Um, <laughs> the People are drawn to each other for a reason. Yeah, it's mostly repulsed for me. But, <laughs> um, hey, it's something. Hey, counterintuitive. That's true. Anyway, what ended up, I, just, uh, I just said, look, I'm happy for that to happen. Could you please just send the picture... Um, and the words, night sky, naked eye, uh, central southern New South Wales, 1824. Uh, at the time, I said 1823 to 27. It, if I hadn't known what I was talking about, it would have been 24 to 28, which is when martial law was established on country. We were the first, uh, nearly the only people martial law was um, inflicted on. Um, and it came back a couple of days later. Um, they crunched the numbers or something. And it came back and it's um, for all those, for just putting that in, uh, in that area, at, in that chronological time, in the night, if you looked up in the clear skies, the Milky Way. So um, that conversation, I, th I figured, well, um, I'm, I'm onto something, oh, yeah. you know, so yeah. let's, yeah, keep, let's yeah. keep going. Yeah, how beautiful. I, I love the, I love paint ugly. I huh. really love that. <coughs> Yeah, mm. just paint ugly. Mm. Um, okay, Lisa, is there a moment in which you felt like what you were doing was right for you or really changed the way you viewed your work? Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I second both of you. I think it's an ongoing thing, which is a really nice surprise to have with um, making art. And, and I think the most recent moment where that's kind of come up was actually on this project, which was working with some uh, men who were currently in detention at, a kangaroo, at the Kangaroo Point detention um, facility. And it was a project called Longer Tables, Not High Offences. And it matched a number of different artists with, with the men in there. And it was a chance to meet with them one-on-one -on -one and hear their personal history and, and their story of what's brought them to Australia and, and the eight years that they they'd spent in in detention since arriving here and so the the person that I connected with he um, had a pretty incredible uh, story and and I think while I've always been aware of the politics around you know this subject of, of asylum seeking it kind of shed light to me on 
how art, even though in the context of our relationship, was a really meaningless um, subject, it, but it was this point of connection that we had and, and, a, and a means of connecting his story to other people as well. So he was actually an engineer and he would steal little bits of um, plastic and paint from the, the one-hour little art lessons that they, they had at the, this facility. And he built the most incredible model of a helicopter. It was like a replica using all of his engineering skills from however many years ago and so part of the artwork that he wanted to develop with me for this this project was a replica of this model but I ended up making it in um in uh, out of sand paint and, and it was just made from paper and cardboard to sit on this table which was then shown at, at Le Bois. And, and I think coming at the end of that project and seeing this piece that I'd developed with him uh, which which shared his story, it, it had some of his words underneath it and it was at a table of all of these different pieces of artwork that the other artists had developed and, and I guess seeing this demographic of people who wouldn't usually um, have any connection or have any exposure to these, these types of works was... Yeah, I, I think that moment for me where I was like, oh, cool, this yeah. is, yeah. Yeah, definitely. This is something. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay, well born. What about you? And what about me? Um, <coughs> there's probably a few pieces. Um, I suppose in a sense it's, the, it's a very relative um, story in the sense that it was based around mess and chaos and mayhem and a lack of control. So the piece that really did it for me, it's called, ironically, it's called Narrabal. Um, I was all, it's a mixed media piece, it's a, it's a big piece, and it's essentially just uh, an image which has been, it's a very prevalent image in my mind, and it's been there for quite a long time. I, 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 I don't truly have a definition as to why this um, image of an elder keeps popping into my head um, and it's constantly there so I'm constantly painting this image but in different ways. The mediums d develop, they advance, they grow but this particular image, this particular painting was the very first time I actually just attacked it and I did it all in one session um, which is what I think made it so much more... Uh, How uh, long was that session? Can I ask? Um, well, <clears throat> it's hard to say because I was painting, for, I'd been painting for three hours I'd say. Um, I was at, you know, a few, few glasses in um, I was pretty relaxed, you know, by this point. The my, <laughs> my consumption had started to kick in. Um, so naturally by the time I started to um, attack it, attack the wall in my studio, it just kind of clicked and it just all happened all in one moment of, I guess, quote unquote, fearlessness. So, and yeah, that image came out and ever since that moment I realised there was something I needed to, to find and obviously I still am finding it. So I guess that's the, that's the point of being an artist, yeah. isn't it? Constantly chasing this invisible entity that you don't understand. It's yeah. kind of like art is the liminal space, right? Yeah. It's the grocery yeah. store aisle on one end, you're trying to get to the other, or the, like air airport mm. terminals, you know? You're not quite at the place where you want to go. Yeah. And maybe at the other point is connection, but yeah. you don't know, you have to keep going. It's like a yeah. Mobius strip of nothing. <laughs> Mm, and you and realise connection. eventually yeah. the mediums, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, well, I guess the next question would be, is there a crazy dream project that you've always wanted to create and what would that be? <laughs> and I know, I know that's kind of um, could be controversial considering the topic, but if there is, what would it be? It's me again, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's always going to be you. Yeah, it's always you. <laughs> Brother, I so love you. Um, yeah, look, it's it's ongoing. Um, I'm in the middle of it all the time. Susie's more in the middle of it all the time because she's the brains of the outfit. Um, so currently, with that, we've got um, we so we thought we'd create a a charity um, because of the overrepresentation of our mobs in every and any. Depart government department or agency that you'd rather not be associated with on the pointy end. Uh, so we started a, a charity called the Wayne Weaver Foundation uh, after Wayne and uh, that's about uh, pre and post release programs for successful long term transition and reintegration for black fellas who are doing time, keeping in mind most of the fellas that, are, that I'm working with, some of them are in their 41st year of incarceration and the reason they ever came to the attention of the authorities because they were taken as children. 
Um, so we've done that. And I think I heard Sue saying before, you know, uh, the challenges around that are it's kind of 180 from the harp seal. Yeah, everybody wants to help the harp seal, nobody wants to help the black fella. And in fact, sometimes we get comments like, well, haven't they got TVs? Mm. Um, and others. So that's a creative venture because we're not funded, because nobody wants to put their name to it and because we just won't stop. That's kind of sitting now where we've created a, pro a, a, um, a product that's based on one conversation, got recommendation for three-year uh, pilot funding. And the two conditions were that it goes national and that the base doesn't have to be in Brisbane. Um, so that, And that's now looking like going out across the Commonwealth. So that's the pre-release. And then the, and the long game with that is, because it's a national initiative, the prisons will have to do it, which means that we give a licence to the local mob for the first... whatever local mob for the first year for nothing they get the returns from that with an option at the end of that to just pay enough out of that per annum to keep developing the program, which means that we will be paying, getting paid by the authorities to heal our mob. Mm. So kind of like that. Mm. The post-release is uh, based on a tried... It's in the can, It's excuse the pun. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's tried and tested. Fellas inside and women and kids all have to have a win. They're very addicted to it. And the, the, the post-release program attends on, and so does the pre-release, attends on offending, to offending behaviour. Ours is cultural. Um, so there are, there are aspects of art definitely within that performance, art, expression, communication, alternatives to violence, all that sort of jazz. Um, yeah, so that's... We're, we've got a tender in at the moment on a um, property in Tawantan, which is where everybody thinks a post release program should be, right near Noosa, and that'll be great. Everybody will be doing pastel and doing lattes. Um, <laughs> we also have a three year um, creative, cultural creative development program. As I say, a brother there earlier on, I, I've got a million at least pet peeves, one of them, and probably the, the, the peak of them, if you get away from the colonisation issue, um, is when young, talented individuals are pounced on by organisations and they create that oasis of attention and, you know, they'll throw the work up on the wall, make a fuss, cheese, wine, kisses, gone. Yeah. Mm. And then there'll be some sort of thing afterwards, which is really just a... a is it, what's swearing like on this? Swear, swear. Please swear. Goodness me. Buck. Sorry. Well, I, he's, my brother's always supported me in what I was going to say. Thank you, <laughs> There you um, go. My bad. But it's just a very disrespectful, uh, entirely, like, in my opinion, <clears throat> it's only mine, a Eurocentric kind of focus on this and, in, and, and reinforcing against poor previous investments and, and making uh, the banal the norm as far as the offering for the arts is concerned. Mm. Um, and that's in its second year now. We, we'll, we'll have our, our intake, this year's intake... Uh, uh, where are we now? Like April or something? Yeah, we're April. Yeah. yeah. So three or May. four months' time. It's May now. Is it? It's May. Yeah, it just turned to May. Two or three months' time. We're all artists, um, listen. Yeah. That's not our job. Susie that's Susie's should have been job. Doing we all that. need a Suze. Yeah. There she is. I couldn't recommend that highly enough, actually, um, and, and others. But uh, and sorry, I'm taking up all the oxygen. No, you're good. I mean, um, you, what you guys have um, achieved is just incredible. So please take up the time. Well, there's just possibly, if I could round it out with one other thing that we were already talking about, um, is the notion of custodianship, um, and that. So, you know, I was thinking I, I um, had the pleasure of wandering through your track record. And um, prior to coming in, well, yesterday. And, um, you know, I just think that thing about privilege, like uh, check your privilege every time. Um, and, uh, you know, I think our example is really our words, our example, even sometimes more than, the, than what we produce, how we carry ourselves, the importance of the, or the responsibility of platform, um, all of that. Is is critical to you know if we, if this topic that we're here about is holding water, then we need to be really 
careful with that, and we need to hold that in a in a in a in a manner and treat that in a manner of custodianship, because those that come next, if we're doing it right, are more able with less impediments or the right impediments for pressure or whatever it is. But checking, making sure that people check their privilege, like and and have a relationship or a, a proper relationship with the First Nations mob around the place, because. Anyone that's not First Nations here that's producing work and not checking in first about what the current issues, because they haven't, it's not historic, it's all current. Agreed, yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, you're missing, on a ho you're missing out on a whole lot. I don't know if that actually made sense. No, so, it does. Yeah. I, w I was actually going to say on that topic, because obviously I work in America, and one of the pieces I actually did was um, I went out, I found a gap in the border when we were having, America was having border issues and they were building the wall and... Um, there's a few gaps, and so I found one on Google Maps <laughs> and wow. got the geolocation and drove, hired a four-wheel drive and drove out there and um, erected a white picket fence, the American <laughs> uh -huh. dream across it. Now, I figured out the um, Border Patrol's schedule by hacking stuff. As you and, do. Yeah, and when they had lunch break, so we had about 45 minutes, um, which turned into 15, and they obviously came with guns and stopped me. Oh. Here's the thing though, I'm a French duke <laughs> and there's a reason why I wasn't scared to do that. Mm. And other people don't have that privilege. Mm. Oh. And it's not recognising that and not talking about it is an injustice to everyone. And Australia, you know, just hasn't done the justice in acknowledging their privilege. It's and same completely true. Yeah. yeah. So yep. optional awareness almost. Yeah. And that's because, like, mm. it's the privilege thing that you were literally just saying. And it's, I feel like um, it's the, say, the information you were even talking about earlier about um, some of the people incarcerated and been in there for 40, 41 years but are, are a product of the stolen generation. Mm. Uh, that information is like, most people wouldn't even know that's even the case. And you look at the statistics of children that are in detention, so for example, in Northern Territory, where it's on what, almost, what, 100% um, are Indigenous. Um, I have I've some friends of people that I know, psychologists who work in the prison system, and they, they associate as it's no longer the stolen generation, it's the incarcerated generation, where it's almost exactly the same thing. But I think, um, would you, do, you feel like, do you feel like in one sense or another it might be that there is some form of shift occurring um, due to the visual art? audience, the, the expressive audience, that there is some potential that um, the information is being received or more interpretable at the time they're in right now, or do you feel like there's still a long way to go? At, at the moment, um, it's, I think movement's not too strong a word or mm. term, um, and it's, it's, it's not exactly pending, but it's not exactly rolling either. I think there's a lot of people um, trying to find a space. It's I think it's difficult to find a space to and to be to remain or to be commercially viable, um, and to be basically putting yourself in a position to be in extremely not accepted or yeah. unacceptable. Yeah. Mm. So um, I think we've got an advantage because we're of our cultural. Um, you know, we can, we are country. Country is us. We are ancestors. Ancestors are us. We don't have a choice, yeah. really. Um, so, uh, but I think the choice comes once you've once you've jumped in. Mm. Oh, sorry, the lack of choice comes once you've once you've jumped in. Mm. Until you jump in, you've still got options, right? So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, right? But I think one of the problems is it too in messaging is that we're lifting up the wrong artists in giving who are displaying that message. Obviously, everyone. I, I believe everyone tries the best with the tools they've got. Mm but lifting up artists like yourselves who are trying to get the messaging up, right? And, and conveying it in a way that is natural and something that is by blood is so important and not, not that other artists aren't important, but the messaging gets lost when they're connecting to people through that cultural shift of making those cultural statements. Um, yeah. You know, even potentially like my work that I was talking about with the white picket fence, that is coming from my perspective mm. and lifting that up and not someone else's who is directly involved in it is kind of the wrong way of going about it. Yeah, well, I mean, <coughs> I suppose in, in one, in a context, yeah. Get lost in this. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, sorry. We'll we'll move on yeah. soon. Don't worry. But um, that's I guess what that's that's. This what is I a suppose. whole other panel. We need mm. a whole panel for yeah. this subject. Yeah. That's why I think I've been I use the the the, f the way of describing myself as I'm trying to like is a medium. Because I, I, I do feel a lot of the time that one of the biggest issues is fear um, and our structure of society is designed around the, around fear. Fear is not is the most successful element used to control the masses. And uh, the information provided, there's always a, a tinge of fear and a little bit of uncertainty that comes with that, especially if, say, for example, you're not mob or you're, you're not culturally educated and it's not because it's not by choice, it's just because you grew up in a society that didn't provide the information for you, so you just didn't know. Information you're being shared today could be the first time you've heard it, and that's not necessarily your fault per se, because of course you weren't told ever. So how how could you possibly know? But then the fear comes into play because you feel a sense of guilt, awkwardness, uh, responsibility, obligation, all these types of things that make you go. Ugh, all I have to do is just take that one step back outside the door and. I'm just going to go get a coffee. And, yeah, and it's an easy choice to be made because Australia has made it an easy choice because that is the way they, they needed it to be so that we didn't highlight the bewildering flaws in the structure of the way society actually is at the moment. And the things that are happening now are perceived as distant memories or distant issues or something that you don't have to worry about. Let's just let these guys over here worry about it. Who are these guys? Ah, it doesn't even matter who they are. It's this, it's this idea of less information, the better. Um, and because of that, when it, when you, as especially now, when obviously you've got more and more expressionists coming forward in performing arts, in music, in particular in music at the moment, we've got some bombers coming through. And then obviously visual art, you've got multiple, multiple artists at the moment who are doing really beautiful and really big things. It's, it's starting to become uh, harder to avoid and harder to hide from because a lot of the a lot of the messages being we're establishing a better way to articulate it so that it's not as hard for people to to accidentally learn about the subject. And I suppose I say medium because I'm okay with being take, taking the punch of someone saying something overwhelmingly insensitive accidentally to help them to see the right way to yeah. approach it. And so I've found that I've had to be, because of who I am, and I know that you'd most likely have exactly the same situation where someone will innocently ask an incredibly offensive question yeah. and instead of reacting, uh, I've learnt that it's not, not intentional and to help them to see the right way to interpret the situation, if that makes sense. No, it does, uh, because I, uh, just to add to what you're yeah, saying yeah. and to continue the conversation, I think it's interesting because my first in inclination is to go, okay, well, tell me what to do, yeah, right? But why one. am I giving you more work? Yeah, okay, it's already yeah. infinitely harder. Yeah. And I think the answer to that is for people like myself to follow your art and just listen. The answers are there. I don't need to go looking for it. Mm. It's not essentially something I can do, what I can do is just listen. Mm. Which is what you get with therapy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling all relaxed, yeah. See so what I did there? Uh, sorry uh, again about taking all the time, yeah. uh, but um, <laughs> it's truth telling. Um, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so with us, uh, you know, we're the only um, First Nations mob that, uh, you know, are enveloped by the Commonwealth that don't have treaty. <laughs> It's an incredibly different position to be into every other First Nations mob on the planet. Um, and so the way that I understand the process to work and the way I adhere to is um, st story first, culture first, story, tell the truth. And present it in a way, you triangulate, cause so you got, and that's why paint and ugly it can be really effective because you can have a... It, and, and likewise, a, a beautiful aesthetic can be really effective because if, when people see an image, they make up their own story immediately about it. Yeah. Everybody does, mm. and then if you and if it's just an image, that's all that ever happens. They have their own story. The artist isn't considered, or the message, or whatever isn't considered. But if there's if there's a story there, then um, there's an opportunity for an emotional response. And because the co the colonisation machine preys on um, the the head doesn't pr really prey on the heart except for fear. Um, but so if you can get an emotional response linked to a visual, linked to a you know a self 
triggered understanding or or re assessing of what you first approached then you know then you can't get away from that you can't you can't unemotion something it just can you no. you know that you're in no. you're in the game <laughs> yeah. so that's with that truth telling i think that's the critical part yeah yep and and follow the people who are telling the truth hmm. yep Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. How do we even follow that up? <laughs> <laughs> God. How about those Yankees? Uh, no, no. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's an actual team, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. There we go. Uh, I, is it? I don't follow I don't sports. Know. I think it was on Happy Gilmore once there was that <laughs> phrase. How about those Yankees? Just like a small talk thing when you've got nothing to talk about. Just say that. Yeah. <sighs> well, I mean, th- <laughs> this has been such an incredible talk and I think maybe we should start to wrap things up mm. um, because you have work to do and murals and art and yes. <laughs> yes, we do. probably some stuff to do in the Brisbane Street Art Festival. Yes. So um, why don't we end on if there's anything that you would like to say or where you're painting or um, any w- upcoming work. Um, why don't we end on that note? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, <laughs> and, and thank you for yeah trying to um, bring it back to me. But that I think that was such an important conversation and so valuable as well because you know it's all about breaking down these institutional barriers and really yeah talking about what comes into platform and diversity and representation. So thank you both for sharing. Um, thank you. Yeah, and and so my work's already finished. It's it's up on Mary Street. It's um, just a personal work. I haven't worked with any communities to to develop that one. Um, and apart from that, I don't really have. What's Much the meaning well. behind that work? What is it? Is there a meaning or you just created? Oh, like there's a little bit of meaning and, and I think I've been uh, moving a bit into my own um, interpretation or, or connection with, with my culture and, and my background on, on my mum's side. Um, so sort of talking about um, these symbolic oriental symbols uh, that are used quite a lot and, and uh, I guess, yeah, people place all different types of value or association on them. So using them in a way that could be uh, novel or tokenistic, but also, um, I guess, putting, abstracting them and, and spiralling them around. So it's whatever you want it to mean as well. It was just a lot of fun to paint for awesome. me, that one. Awesome. All right. Well born. Oh, goodness. Um, well, I'll, the most... The next thing is uh, probably on the 8th of May uh, in this building again. We'll be activating it again um, for a Bad Olive um, event. Um, it's essentially going to be more based around exploring the fashion scene in Brisbane at the moment. Um, so there'll be more um, the up this emerging fashion industry that is in Brisbane. Um, there hasn't really been a great deal of platform for that that area of expressionism in, in Brisbane of late. So therefore, we've been really focusing on that a lot over the last year and a bit. Um, the shows have been going quite well. So obviously, Lincoln was um, kind enough um, to offer the space as a part of that, that that journey. So next weekend, we have that event, which um, should be really exciting, um, really stimulating. And then I'm doing a mural in uh, Queen Street Mall on the 11th to the 15th, I think, of May in the Mall of Kitsch, the artist Kitsch, which should be quite fun, actually. Awesome. And um, you can obviously follow all of that on the Bris- Brisbane Street Art Festival um, social media and I'm sure Super Ordinary as well. What about you, Baranga? We've got a um, really lovely opportunity um, down at the Princess Theatre in Woongabba. Um, we were offered, I, I don't know if we got first look, but I, I think we probably did first look at the walls there and, and chose the ones that suited us the best. So Kane Brungies is an Ungari Kabi Kabi lad um, who's their first, uh, second year, no, yes, yes, second year person in our um, program and Steve Yeo Chin who was here last night uh, who's Kabi Kabi, Waka Waka, you and, and Kawa. Um, they both share that Carby heritage. Um, we've got a mural to produce there, and we spoke with the uh, we we you, you know treated the owner as the client. Um, they had certain things, and we uh, tried to uh, accommodate that, and but it didn't float our boat. So we went in a different direction, and but they happily Lincoln, and and they have really gone with it, and. I think the title is from the first sunrise, um, and that'll that'll be that uh, a new, and we start that on Tuesday, I think. Amazing. Uh, and then um, there's only sorry, just taking up all the. 
No, you're good. Keep going. A mate named Harry Frith, um, Gabba lad who grew up on Budrum as well. He's four years my junior. Um, he's been shooting movies and whatnot in LA for the past couple of decades. He's back. And a really unaffected fellow, like really about the work, you know, and about the story. So um, we've concocted an idea where Kane and Stevie are going to share that, uh, their shared Carvey heritage. And Harry and I both were born, uh, grew up in Budrum on Carby Carby Country, so that he's going to shoot them in still and and uh, not still, whatever that's called, and uh, they're going to pro produce works of stories. That, there's so many massacres on that country, right? Yeah. And it's so close. So there's going to be a lot of truth telling, um, and really excited about it because I got no. I'm directing it, which means that nobody will have any idea what's going to happen <laughs> all the way no. through. So no. yeah. No. So thank you. Um, okay, one last thing, and I know it's annoying, but how does everyone follow your work? <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> Wellborn on Instagram? Just Wellborn. Got w it. E L L B O R N. It's uh, very literal. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> so good and simple. Um, mine is The Moon Gallery, all one word. On Instagram? On Instagram. Is that you? That's uh, me. That's <laughs> Um, ours is Bur it's all the platforms, but the website for the gallery, and that's uh, barunga.com.au, b i w r u n g a dot c o m dot au. Awesome, awesome. All right, let's give a hand to the artist and say hello to your astrophysics friends for me, and um, see you at Brisbane Street Art Festival. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, of course.